Okay, so today and possibly part of Monday, uh, we're going to cover the last uh, NCAP topic for this course, which is databases. Um, you know, you'll use this in uh, Lab 15, but uh, the real database work would be saved for Computer Science 2 if you're moving on to that, CSCE 156, uh, where we uh, will cover in detail how to design a relational database, uh, SQL and how to access a database th both through SQL and uh, programmatically. Uh, in your lab tomorrow, we've already written the code that programmatically accesses the database, performs the query and stuff like that. You just need to understand how the database fundamentally works so that you can use our program to, to put stuff into a video game database and then list out the results. So uh, the, the whole purpose of databases is because data is fundamental, right? Every, every program that we've written up to this point is processing data of some sort. Uh, it might just be two numbers and finding, or one number and finding the square root of that number, uh, or it could be uh, an entire, like you're doing in, right now in Hack in your final uh, assignment, uh, processing uh, hundreds or maybe millions of records of financial transactions. Uh, so data is fundamental and we need a way of storing data, right? Now in C, what we've seen so far, uh, we represent data how? What's the, what, how would you represent, say, just a regular old number? As an integer, or a double, or a string, right? Char star, right? Those are individual pieces of data. Uh, but we, we found eventually that that's not enough, right? Not everything is one number. Not everything is just one string, one name. So we found a way that we can take multiple pieces of data and collect them in together into one entity. What was that called? How do we do, what, what, what do we do? Structures, or structures, structs, right? Structures, that is struct. Struct, there we go, structs. Right. Uh, these are collections of data, in other words, records, right? And now we're getting more and more towards what a database holds, a database holds records, right? Uh, but we also have a relationship between entities, right? Uh, remember the book, uh, I think we did films, right? And we had a film and a director, uh, and then, uh, uh, or the film also had a release date. We, d we decided, hey, wait a second, a release date, that sounds like its own thing, its own entity. So we have relationships between entities. And how did we achieve that in C? If I've got a, st a structure that represents a date, a release date, and a structure that re represents film, then what I did is I took an instance of date and I put it inside of this other structure. What, what did we call that? Does anybody remember? Composition, right? One thing is composed of another. Uh, that one structure can be composed of another structure or structures, right? I'll add S there, because you can have multiple ones. Uh, but ultimately, programs are short-lived, right? Uh, we sometimes refer to this as ephemeral. Ephemeral, right? They're short-lived, right? Uh, most of your programs have hopefully only been a few milliseconds. Uh, now, on your final uh, assignment, keep in mind that you will be operating on millions of records. Uh, and it might take, you know, a uh, half a minute, maybe uh, 15 seconds or so uh, to process all those records. But certainly you should not be looking for a brute force solution uh, in, in any of those exercises. Otherwise, you're looking at not just seconds or tens of seconds or, or a minute. Now you're looking at weeks of processing if you do it, uh, if you do it wrong on that the final assignment. And you'll just see it sit and spin until it kicks you out for after five minutes. Uh, but programs uh, generally are short-lived. We need a way to save, I'll, I'll save, save data from one program to another. Right? And it, 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 think about this in a, a bigger context. We could have a C program that accesses this data, uh, processes it, and pr produces a report. We could have a Java program come in and process the same data. We could have another program written in Python and processing the same data. We could have a, a bunch of different technologies, a bunch of different users that are all using and consuming the same data. Uh, we want to be able to save it in a universal format that's not just a C format. So we're not talking about structures anymore. 
Uh, we're not going to want to save it in a format that's a Java class because we want other programs to be able to read it. So we need a universal way of storing this data. Right? Uh, we, well, we, 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 in, the in, the, uh, in the area, we call this persistence. Data needs to be persisted. Right? Now, persisted just me is a fancy word for saving data. Right? Uh, persistence means that it persists after your program is done. Right? Your program is done, your data should not go away. Your data should not die with your program. Uh, we need a way to persist it across multiple runs of programs or between different programs. Right? Uh, now, there are several ways that you can do this. Right? Uh, what ways have we looked at for, uh, so far to store uh, storing data so far? Right? In general, what we've, uh, what we've seen is storing data in files. Right? Uh, what's one way that we've stored data or we've processed data, uh, data formatting that you've seen in this class so far? What's one way that you're processing it right now for Hack 15 and uh, your final assignment? What's the input? Uh, what's the input formatting? CSV, right? That's comma separated value files, right? Or, or sometimes these are referred to as flat files files. Uh, why? Because the data model has been flattened down and, uh, and you know, you're taking this kind of multi-dimensional idea and you're flattening it down onto one file you, where, where you've got columns and you've got rows. Uh, for example, here's, some, here's a CSV file containing uh, information on uh, textbooks. Uh, well, it, 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 here's the course that's associated with that. Here's the title of the textbook. You can see this up in the headers here. Uh, here's the author or authors. Uh, here are the topics that are covered, Java or PHP or uh, what else, uh, uh, whatever, whatever else is in here. Uh, and then the URL for the actual book. This is a list of free books. Uh, so we, what we've done is we've flattened the data model here. Uh, and you can see that it has, well, it has several disadvantages immediately. Uh, for example, uh, what's, one, what's one disadvantage that you can see? Say what? It's oh, definitely hard to read. It's not intended for human consumption. Uh, you would want to put this into a nice looking table, HTML formatted table, uh, where you've got these headers and you've got rows and columns and everything. Uh, but it, it's, it's essentially the same format. It's just less human readable. Uh, but what, take a look at the first three entries here. Right? What do you see repeated? The course number is repeated for all three of those. right? And there's lots of repetition uh, further down if you look at all these, like 322. There are seven or eight uh, different books for that course. And they, they all repeat the same course number here. Right? So you've got repetition of data. Not only that, but uh, you have some real drawbacks here as far as uh, CSV files are concerned. Uh, now, to, to, dr to draw your attention to what those might be, think of uh, a typical Word file. Open up a Word file, start typing, start typing, you save it. Uh, now you saved it on the desktop. Let's go ahead and try to drag that over to the garbage or the recycle bin or whatever it is. What's going to happen? Have you ever tried that? You've, oh, uh, the file is open up in another program, and you try to delete it. Right. it, it it's not going to allow you to do that. Uh, does anybody know why? Well, it's in use over here. Right? It's going to have what's called a file lock. Now, a file lock is a program, that, uh, the operating, uh, you, you open up a file, and you say, I want to read this file. I want to process this file, write to it maybe. And, I, and the operating system puts a lock on it. Once that lock is on, if it's a read-write lock, then nothing else can come in and write to it. Uh, so your attempts to try to delete this are trying to violate that, uh, that file lock. The operating system is not going to let you do that. Uh, so uh, there's a file lock in it. But now think about this in a, a context of multiple users or multiple programs trying to get to this file. If one program comes in and starts processing this file here, then, uh, then th that prevents any other program from coming in and processing the file. Does that sound like a, a good recipe for a responsive application? If it's like, say, a web app. Uh, say uh, Google worked that way. Only one person in the world could use Google at, at a time. And then once they were done, then the next person could use it. Then the next person could use it. Right? No, definitely not. 
Uh, we want to be able to have multiple users, in other words, multiple programs, accessing our file at once. And a flat file doesn't do that, because if one program comes in and starts processing it, it might put a file lock on it, it might make changes to it, and that prevents other uh, programs from accessing it at the same time. Not only that, but what if I wanted to pr produce a report here? What if I wanted to find uh, a book related to C uh, cryptography? So I'll go ahead and go find crypto cryptography, crypto. Oh, oh, it's not in here. Should be down at the bottom. Find crypto, crypto. There we go. I just misspelled it. So it's down at the very bottom. If I were to write a program to search through and find anything that was related to cryptography, or in particular this this uh, class right here, what would I have to do? I'd have to open up the file, process the first line then the second line, then the third line, and finally get down to the needle in the haystack all the way down here. Or what if I wanted to find all books related to this course, 155E? Well, I immediately find it at record four, but then I need to process every other record after it just to make sure that I didn't miss one. Right? In other words, to do anything, I have to process an entire file, every single piece of data, even if I'm only looking for that one needle in the haystack. Right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a good recipe for efficiency. It's not a good recipe for uh, uh, any re kind of responsive uh, application in, uh, or, or, or anything, right? So CSV files are not going to work for us. Another, another issue here is, again, that it's not structured, right? If I, just, uh, if I took out everything uh, and just uh, say, say that I, I, I didn't give you that first line there that said that it was a course, title, authors, et cetera. Would you know what any of these were? Maybe you'd, uh, maybe you'd know because you're a student here, and oh, well, CSCE 322, that looks like a class to me, right? But if, uh, you wouldn't know that if you were not from UNL or not in the, in the computer science department. Uh, prologue tutorial, well, uh, maybe if you knew what prologue was, maybe if, uh, what if the title was just prologue? Maybe it was a guy named Prologue, and that's the author, right? Uh, there's no semantic meaning to any of this stuff. The only semantic keys that I've got up here are the headers to these things. The, uh, if you want to look at this as a table, the, uh, head, uh, the headings on your table. That's what tells you what this column represents. But without that, the rest of this data is completely meaningless. So there's no semantic meaning to this. However, there is semantic meaning to an alternative way of uh, representing data. If you remember back to your file I.O. lab, you looked at one or maybe two of them. Uh, what? Uh, uh, H uh, almost HTML. Uh, more generally than that, HTML is a part of XML, which is extensible markup language. Right? Extensible. I think that that's how you spell it, right? Uh, and this uh, this uh, has a tree. Uh, it, it it represents data as a tree hierarchy, hierarchy uh, using uh, semantic markup. Right. And now what does that mean? Let me go ahead and open up an example. Here's that exact same data, a bunch of books represented as XML data. Now we've got semantic meanings here. That I've got, uh, I've, this, this is a semantic tag here that says what follows inside of this tag and uh, all the way down to this closing tag at the very bottom here, if I can scroll, uh, it, uh, there are books. right? And each one of these things is a book. And within this, this string right here represents the course. This string rep right here represents the title, et cetera. This string represents the URL. Now, again, you have the same problem here that there's a lot of repetition here, uh, that you are repeating these tags over and over and over again. But that's the cost of giving semantics to, uh, to data. Now everything is at least labeled. And if you've got a label for everything, you can also define a, uh, a what's called a schema. Uh, a schema is that uh, every book should, is required to have a, a course, a title, and uh, an author. But maybe the topic is optional. Uh, maybe the URL is optional. And if it's a URL, then you know that this needs to be uh, some, uh, the, that this needs to be a well-formatted URL. Uh, foo is not a well-formatted URL, so you could actually validate this stuff and see if it's valid XML or not. Let me go ahead and go back here. 
Uh, now, you can visualize this a little bit, and I've, I've already done that over here. Here's the same data. You can see that it's hierarchical. You can collapse this stuff down. This is the root element at the very top. Uh, this is, uh, uh, now, this is another element. Then under that, you've got all of these other elements that you can collapse or expand. In other words, you've got a tree hierarchy here. Now, in computer science, our trees grow downward. The root is always at the top, and the leaves are always down here. So you just have to get used to that. When I say tree, all of our trees are always going to grow downwards. So up here at the top, we've got the, 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 uh, the root. Down here at the bottom, these are our leaves. These are the end data points that have semantic meaning because of all those, uh, those tags. Now, one pro again, one problem of XML is that there's a lot of repetition here. Uh, so along came another way of representing stuff. And I don't know that we've uh, had a chance to look at it, but uh, do you, uh, does it, uh, have we, uh, have any of the uh, labs covered JSON? Or introduce the notion of JSON? OK. JSON is Java, Java script object notation. Right? And it's basically a, a, a lighter weight data representation that has the same uh, advantages, disadvantages, if you want to call them, of XML. Uh, so here it is. Here's the exact same data as before. Uh, but instead of repeating the ending tag here, we've got what's called a key value kind of schema, where this is a key, then we've got a colon, and this is the value of that key. So the course, uh, that's the key, and then this thing right here is, uh, the string right here is represented by double quotes. Uh, you can also have numbers uh, and, and stuff like that. Uh, the opening of each object is an opening curly bracket, then comma, opening curly bracket, comma, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, commas delimit each one of those keys. Uh, and we've got a uh, opening square bracket and an op and closing square bracket to denote arrays. So we've got a little bit more, uh, uh, we've got a little bit uh, different way of, of expressing this stuff, uh, but it's the exact same data. It's just a different formatting. And I think I've got a visualization over here. Oh, okay, the visualization of that data just collapses it down into this uh, uh, in, into this uh, table kind of uh, way of representing stuff. All right. So those are three different ways of representing data in regular old files, but it's still not enough. Uh, those, are way, uh, th those are all, uh, at least XML and JSON, are related to something called EDI. Uh, that's electronic, electronic Data Interchange. The whole purpose of XML and JSON is not necessarily to be, uh, uh, ha have integrity, like a data integrity, like a database would. Uh, their purposes are to transmit data from one program to another that may not necessarily speak the same language. In other words, a C program can go ahead and persist to a, J uh, a JSON file, and then a Java program can open that up, and as long as they know the same formatting, then they can, they can talk to each other through that data. Uh, even though usually you don't, uh, you don't have C programs inter uh, interfacing with Java programs. Uh, and that's what we call EDI, Electronic Data Interchange. You want to get data in into a universal format so that you can transmit that data to any other kind of, a, a, of a system written in any language so that they can all understand it. Right? It's, a, it's basically a translation to a, a universal language. Right? All right, well, again, disadvantages. The disadvantages are numerous. Right? To find a particular record or records, requires processing the entire file. Right? You have to load it all up into memory. Uh, there is no easy way for multiple programs to access the same file at the same time right? because of file, file locks. Right? Uh, the, so in other words, there's no, uh, the, 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 there's no parallelization. There's no uh, asynchronicity like we just talked about with uh, uh, graphical user interfaces, right? Uh, there, uh, the, 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 there's no format enforcement, right? Especially with with uh, CSV files, uh, you could screw up and and, and screw around and, and mix up the tokens, right? There's no integrity. There's repetition of data. There's no integrity enforcement, etc. Right, if you want one column to be a number, well, if it's just in a file, in a flat file, that number ends up being a string representation format of that number. 
And, and there's nothing to prevent me from putting in hello instead of 42 uh, and violating the expectations of, of the data format. Uh, there's, uh, and uh, there are all, also a bunch of other issues. For example, in CSV files, everything is delimited by a comma. How do you escape those? Right? Well, you could go ahead and, and close everything in double quotes. Well, now how do you escape those double quotes? Right? Uh, in fact, it turns out to be a very difficult problem in general to process CSV files. That's why you should use a library in, in general. We kept things simple in this course, but in actuality, there, uh, to deal with uh, true CSV formatting requires a lot of corner cases, right? Uh, and, that, and that's best handled by a library, okay? Uh, all of those disadvantages lead to da data anomalies. The real solution is an RDBMS, right? This is a relational database management system RDBMS or RDMS if you do, if you if you're into brevity uh, DB is usually database but it's one word uh, it, uh, maybe it started out as two words I don't know but now it's one word and it's only database sometimes people camel case it and just call it database with uh, capital D to capital D, B uh, but it's it's one word right uh, uh, a, DB, a DBA is a database administrator. Usually, uh, for whatever for whatever re reason, we usually uh, acronymize acronymize here. Whenever we use it as an acronym, we use a DB instead of database or j instead of just D. Right? Uh, in an RDBMS, in a real database system, data is stored in tables. Right? Oops. So that you might already have an intuition about this, uh, having you say used Excel, right? And now Excel is not a database. If you are in an Office suite, what is the database that Microsoft offers? Does anybody know? Access. Access, exactly. That's the real database. Excel is just a spreadsheet, but it's kind of the same idea. You've got columns and you've got rows, right? Uh, each uh, each table. Each table. Uh, contains columns and oh, columns, which are uh, pieces of data, or well, how do I want to put this? Uh, individ uh, individual pieces of data, and each table has rows. These are individual records. Right? So just like say this visualization over here, this could be thought of as a table where uh, you know, e each one of the columns, this is an author column, this is the course column, and then each one of these rows is an individual record. So if you want to think about it in terms of structures, each one of these, uh, these rows would correspond to an actual structure. Right? But it's a little bit more complicated than that because we also have relationships between tables. If you want to think about it in terms of books, you have a book and you have an author. Right? These are separate entities, just like the film and the release date were separate entities. So if we were to do this in C, we would probably want to have a structure to represent a book and a structure to represent an author. How do we relate these two things together? If it were in C, what would you do? A book is written by an author, right? So to model that, what would you do in, in, in a book uh, structure? In fact, let's do it, right? As an aside, design a book author uh, structure, structures. Good review for what you're doing in your hack this week, making yet another structure. So how do I do a, uh, uh, I want one for an author, right? So type def struct author, right? And I probably want one for a book, type def struct Struct book. OK. Define an author here. First name, last name, OK. That's a char star, first name, semicolon, char star, last name. And of course, they could have a date of birth. They could have a social security number. They could have a bunch of other stuff. Let's just keep it simple. And let's go ahead and say that they have a first name and a last name. Now, define a book. Char star title. OK, I like that. OK, genre, char star, genre. Except for, well, wait a second, what is a genre? You can have a genre that has a title 
and then also subgenres or something like that. And you could have multiple genres. Uh, I'll just keep it simple now for and have it one have there have there be one a string representation mystery sci-fi right nonfiction whatever. Right. Yeah, how do I do an author now? Author A or if you want a pointer to it, author, right? The, so could I define it like this instead? No, why? Because book uses author, therefore author has to be declared first. Same way in a database, by the way, when we eventually do this. Uh, that if an author writes a book, that author has to exist before that book can exist. The book cannot exist before the author exists. Uh, so that kind of relationship there we, needs to be maintained. And the order also is important, both in C and in databases. Right? So we've got composition here. How would we do that in a database, though? So a database doesn't have composition. Instead, a database defines relations between tables. For example, again, let's take this author book table. Or say that we have author and book tables that basically kind of look like this. They have a column that's a string for last name, a column that's a string for first name, and over here we've got another separate table over here that has a column for title and then a column for author. Right? How do we end up doing that? Right? So the relations can take uh, in, in a database can take one of two forms. In fact, they can take a little bit more than this, but I'm only going to cover these two. You have a one to many relationship. Right? That one record in table A can relate to one or more, that is many, uh, records in table B. Right? Or you can have a many to many relationship, which is one, uh, multiple records in table A can relate to multiple records in table B. Right? Or put another way, many to many, one record in table A can relate to multiple, uh, many records in table B, and one record in table A or B can relate back, and I'll put that in parentheses, to many records in table A. Right? So we're, we've got this back and forth kind of thing. Now, with respect to an author and a book table, let's just keep it simple for now. What kind of a relationship is there between those two? So we've, we've got an author that can write a book, right? So one author can be associated with at least one book over here. That same author, maybe they only wrote one book and then died or never did anything else ever again. But most authors have multiple books, right? At least most successful authors have multiple books. Many unsuccessful authors also have many books, right? And uh, unfor unfortunately, the uh, terrible authors have many, many, many books, right? So one author can have many books, right? So with the book, uh, uh, one author may have written many books, right? So in other words, we have a one to many relation from the author table to a book table, if we were to, uh, to write these out as two different tables, right? What about, what about the relationship from the book table to the author table? Right? If we were to think about it in reverse. So author table to book table, there's a one to many relation over here. If you think about it in reverse, it's a many to one relation. So that's yet another type of relation, but it's the same thing, it's just in reverse. So you just have to, uh, instead of reading right to left, you read uh, left to right, right? So it's basically the same thing. Uh, what if you wanted to model the uh, situation where one author or one book could be written by multiple authors? 
So there, th that happens, right? Uh, even, uh, even just regular old novels can have multiple authors. They collaborate and produce a, a new book or something, right? Uh, oftentimes, many uh, academic books, uh, textbooks will have multiple authors, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what kind of a relationship is there, uh, is, that, uh, is that? One author could have multiple books. We still want to do that. But one book could be written by multiple authors. So if we've got a one-to-many and a one-to-many in the other direction, so a one-to-many or a many-to-one in the other direction, then what kind of, an, uh, then what kind of a uh, relation do we want? A many-to-one many relationship. Right? This is why we call them relational database systems, relational database management systems. That two different tables, separated out uh, pieces of data, can be related to each other in some way. What this does is it reduces repetition. It reduces redundancy. If you've got an author over here, uh, I'm reading Christopher Moore right now. So Christopher Moore. Right? We don't have multiple Christopher Moore wrote this book, and Christopher Moore wrote this book, and Christopher Moore wrote this book. Right? We just have one Christopher Moore record. And then what we do is we say, well, he wrote that book and that book and that book. We have a one to many relationship to the other table. And that reduces the redundancy because now we only have one record for each author. We only have one record for each book. The multiple records that would be in, like, a, say, a flat file are represented through that relationship. Right? And we'll do this again on Monday, and I'll, I'll show you a visualization of it. Okay? But that's the basic idea. In an RDB, RDBMS, uh, 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 records, records are identified with a primary key and uh, relationships between records are identified with a foreign key. Right. So a primary key is nothing more than a unique identifier. For all intents and purposes, it could be just a number. Right? Here's the first book, the second book, the third book, the fourth book, etc. Right? All those numbers are meaningless. Now, out in the real world, real books are ident uniquely identified with what? How do you uh, uniquely identify a book? Uh, with an ISBN or an extended ISBN. ISBNs are guaranteed to be unique, and they are attached to a book. In fact, they're attached to a particular edition of a book, uh, or, uh, or maybe even a printing of a book. Uh, how is a person in the real world uh, represented uniquely, say, in this country? A social security number or a tax ID number or something like that. If it were the university, then everybody in here is identified uniquely through an NUID number. Right? And hopefully they're all unique. If you ever get somebody else's NUID, uh, great, you're either paying for their tuition or they're paying for yours, right? uh, one way or the other. Uh, but it's got to be unique. So that's what we call a primary key. A foreign key is that this, if we want to specify that this book was written by this author, we need a foreign key. We need a foreign key over here in this, uh, in, this, in this book table that says that it was actually written by that author over there. How do we identify this author over here? Through their primary key. So if we've got a book, uh, the book I'm reading is Fool by Christopher Moore. Say that Christopher Moore is identified by 42. Right? Uh, this book was written by not author Christopher Moore as a string over here, but instead as a key, a foreign key, back to the primary key over here, 42. That's how we relate things between those two tables. So with that in mind, instead of visualizing it, we'll save that for Monday, let's go ahead and come over here and update our structures. If we want, a, uh, if we want to emulate kind of a database, what else would we need in our structures over here? We would need a primary key. And for all, again, for all intents and purposes, let's just make it an integer. Right? Uh, and I'll say uh, it's a, an author ID. Right? It's usual to give them the names uh, uh, that match the, the, the table name and then followed by ID uh, so that you don't have the same ID, 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 ID in all of your tables. Uh, you know which ID it is. It's the author ID. Uh, and it's also, uh, and also following that same naming convention will, um, will, will, uh, will enforce uh, uniformity on your uh, database. Likewise, 
for a book table, we'll want a unique identifier. So I'll do the same thing, book ID. Right. Now, how do I say, let me go ahead and get rid of this now. Right. Now, that's how you would do it in C. That's the proper way of doing it. Uh, but let's think about this in terms of databases instead. I want to relate a book to an author. I want a foreign key instead, an integer that matches this primary key up here. All, the way that I do that is just the same thing. Right? Now, if, uh, if I've got a book ID of 37 or something like that, uh, and then title, uh, Fool by Christopher Moore. It doesn't have Christopher Moore down here as a string. It doesn't have a, uh, a, uh, a pointer to an author structure. Instead, it has an ID that if I go over to this table and look up the author ID for that table, that's the author that I'm looking for. Now I can look at their first name, Christopher, and I can look at their last name, Moore. Right? That's the relationship between tables. Right? Now, again, in, uh, uh, in uh, C, uh, uh, pr uh, pr doing this proper would be uh, what we had before, this thing. But in a database, all, you don't want repetition, because that would actually repeat the first name, the last name, uh, among multiple uh, structures, potentially. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to reduce that redundancy and only keep what is relevant, the author ID. Because if I've got the author ID, 42, I can always go to the author table and look that up if I really need to. Right? All right, so that's the basic idea. Uh, in addition, our DB, uh, uh, databases provide uh, many nice features. For example, security. If you've just got a file and anybody has access to that file in the system, a flat file, anybody can open it, anybody can look at that data. Uh, if you've got a full database management system, though, you can say that that user can have access to that table over there, but they can't write any data. They can only read data from that table. That user can read and write data to that table if they really want to. That user cannot have access to the table, that table, but they can have access to that table over there. That little fine-grained security, that comes for, uh, free with a, uh, a proper database system. Right? Uh, and of course, you can shut off secu uh, the security. Uh, it can be remote, right? You can, uh, data storage can now be done with a remote uh, database server instead. It doesn't have to be on the same machine. Uh, in fact, many uh, databases are, are, are stored in the cloud, is what they call it now. The cloud has existed for 50 years. It's just a fancy name for another computer on the network. Right? Uh, and so usually, it, it, it is usual to have your database server separate from your application server and uh, data uh, uh, transmitted back and forth. Right? Uh, just a second. Uh, no. OK. Uh, let's see. Uh, what else? Uh, they provide, uh, uh, not portability, but what I want, um, let's see, what else? Uh, they, prov uh, they enforce inte data, inter data integrity and relations. Right? Uh, you cannot uh, create a book record, say, without first creating an author record, an author record. And that kind of data integrity will be enforced. Uh, you cannot uh, put a string value into a into a numerical column. That kind of data is now enforced. Uh, you can put in constraints. Uh, they offer constraints. For example, uh, suppose uh, an author's last name is required. Right. You can enforce that uh, that constraint by putting it into the database rules. Uh, the database will enforce that constraint. If you have a constraint that the, the last name cannot be null, you can also put that into the rules and it'll enforce it for you. In other words, whatever rules you have about your data, you can codify those rules, put them into the database, and have a guarantee that that database will never have bad data according to the rules that you provide. Of course, you can prov provide bad rules, and oftentimes many databases are uh, poorly designed and allow that. Uh, but uh, whatever rules you define will be enforced. Uh, they also provide um, multi-user, multi-user uh, parallel access, etc. Right? 
All the problems that we identified with flat files that only one program can, uh, can access it at a time, that's solved with a relational database management system. Right? Uh, in addition, there are a couple more uh, acronyms here that I'm going to give you. Uh, databases provide what are called the ACID principles. Right? Uh, ACID, uh, uh, so all uh, uh, RDBMS, DBMSs, DB, RDBMSs uh, provide, uh, provide uh, access to data through what are called transactions. In fact, I'm regretting doing this up here. Let me go ahead and move it up here. Uh, yeah. Just a second. I don't even know how to shut off a phone. I am not a big phone user. There. All right. So the ACID principles. Uh, when you interact with a database, you interact with what's called a transaction. Uh, so suppose that you want to insert some data. I want to insert a book record and a book record. Well, wait, you need to insert an author record first. So I'll go ahead and insert this author record and insert this book record and insert this book record. So I'm doing three things at once. I can wrap that up into a transaction. So that suppose that I insert the author, that, that was successful, right? There is no problem with that data. And then I insert a book record, second, but there is a problem with that data. What happens is the entire transaction is rolled back. In other words, it's treated atomically. These three, these three queries that I'm going to submit to the, the, the database, it's all treated as one thing. So it is all successful or none of it is successful. That ensures that you have uh, a, a well-formatted database, oh, uh, or, uh, data integrity in your database is what I want to say. And that's part of the ACID principles. Uh, ACID, uh, ACID stands for atomicity. Uh, consistency, uh, integ uh, not integrity, um, isolation, and not dependability, it is durability. It's difficult to remember them because they all have nice synonyms that basically mean the same thing. So wh what is, what is an, at an atomic operation? Now, prior to the 20th century, what did atomic mean? Of course, in the 20th century, we know atoms. We called the, the small, uh, prior to the 20th century, they called the smallest particles pro possible atoms. Now, in the 20th century, we know that atoms are not the smallest possible particle. We've got what? Quarks, mesons, luons, and whatever else, right? Atoms are made up of other things, right? Uh, and so atoms are not atomic. But prior to the 20th century, atomic meant indivisible. Uh, so a transaction is indivisible, and that's what atomicity means. That a transaction is an all or nothing operation. Right? Either a transaction is, uh, uh, either the, the entire transaction is successful, or none of it is. Because you don't want to be in a situation where you've inserted the author and you've inserted the first book, but the second book, that failed, I don't want to be in, a, in an intermediate state. I want to make sure that everything actually occurred. Right? If you want to separate each one of those three into one transaction, two transactions, three transactions, you can do that if you really want to. But if you want to group operations so that it's an all or nothing thing, an RDBMS will provide that through atomicity. Consistency means that uh, uh, let me see. Uh, a database will always remain in a consistent state. That is, uh, before a transaction occurs, all rules you've defined will be followed. And after a transaction is successful, we call this committed. If, it, if it's not committed, then it is rolled back, uncommitted if you want, uh, success, well, there we go. Uh, all rules will be followed. But in between, rules may be temporarily broken. Right? 
In other words, if the database decides it's going to be more efficient for me to temporarily break these rules that you defined in order to insert these records and then go back and clean it up so that those rules are, are uh, enforced again, it'll do so. Right? It, it, databases are extremely efficient. They're highly optimized. They know what they're doing. Uh, so the only rules that it can provide is before that transaction occurs, all the rules that you've defined will be followed. After that transaction is done and successful, then all the, uh, then all the rules that you've defined uh, will be followed. Now, what, what do I mean by rules? I mean the relationship rules, those that we identified up above, uh, that you cannot put uh, string data into a numerical column. You can't create an, uh, a book record without an author record uh, existing first. Uh, if you define that this column cannot be null, then it will not be, uh, no, no record in that, uh, in that database will have a null value for that column. Right? All those rules will be enforced. Isolation refers to the fact that a tra uh, no transaction steps on the toes of another transaction. Right? That, in other words, the, the transaction, when it starts, uh, it'll start in a state in the database such that no other transaction, it, no, it doesn't know about any other transaction. If a transaction comes in and, starts, uh, and wants to know how many book records are there, it starts counting them up. One, two, three, four. Now another transaction comes in and says, I want to add a new book record right in the middle. Right? And the, the, the first transaction is already counted past that, uh, that. It's not aware that this new book is in here. It only counted before its transaction started, and it will never see this book record coming in. That's how you get multi-user support. That's how you get multi-threaded support. Uh, because everything is going to be in isolation of each other. Right? Uh, and finally, durability. That once a transaction is committed, it remains so. Right? And usually the analogy that I give is if, uh, if, if, a trans if, if a transaction, if you start a transaction and it's processing, 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 somebody comes up and kicks the power cord out of your server, Right? then that transaction never got completed. It never got committed. When you bring up your database server again, it's like it never happened. Right? Uh, it will not be in an intermediate state where all of your, or some of your rules might be violated. Uh, so that's where you've got durability. That once the transaction is committed, it will remain so forever. Right? Uh, but, uh, anything, uh, but anything before that and after that, uh, that, that that's on you. Uh, but uh, yeah, in between, it, it, it'll recover back to uh, a consistent state, I should say. Right? Those are the ACID principles. The last uh, acronym soup that I'm going to give you today is CRUD. Right? So databases provide, actually, no, not the last acronym that I'm going to give you, uh, pro provide access through the structured query language. Right? That's SQL. Some people uh, pronounce this SQL. If somebody pronounces it SQL, you know that they've grown up or that they, they were introduced to databases through Microsoft products because that's how Microsoft, uh, like a SQL server, SQL server, that's Microsoft's thing. Uh, otherwise, if, if it's not, if it's just SQL, then, uh, then th they probably weren't introduced to it through uh, Microsoft. Uh, anybody who pronounced it SQ uh, SQL? All right, nobody's seen C uh, SQL yet? That's fine. Uh, and SQL provides CRUD. CRUD is create, retrieve, update, and destroy. So think about all the records in a database. What would you want to do with them? Right? Create means the er, in, uh, inserting new records into a table or tables. Right? You're creating new data. Retrieving means selecting data out of a table or tables. Right? You're retrieving the data out of the database. Because if you didn't have retrieve, you're just putting stuff in. You never get stuff out. You want both of those. You save data to the database. You persist data to the database. You would certainly want to be able to get it out of the database. Update is modifying, modifying uh, uh, current data in the database. So it's a little bit different than creating data because uh, it's, uh, that record already exists, but I misspelled their, their name or something. Uh, Christopher Moore, uh, now he wants to be known as Chris instead. So we'll go ahead and update and then change his first name to Chris instead. Um, uh, so modif uh, update is modifying data. What about destroying data? That would be removing a record in a table 
four tables. Right? And that's what we mean by CRUD. Th these are the four basic operations of any piece of data. You might want to create data. You might want to manipulate it, you know, uh, update it a little bit. You might want to produce a report. That's, uh, that's retrieving data out of the database so that you can uh, report it in a table or something like that. Or you can go through and count up the number of books written by one particular author. Or give me all books by all authors whose names begins with a C, right? whose first name begins with a C. That's retrieving data. Uh, destroying data is simply just removing data from the database. And we call that CRUD. In fact, we usually call uh, like web apps, if you're, if you're developing a web app or if you're developing a basic CRUD application, uh, it's kind of a pejorative term because it's CRUD, right? It's garbage, it's crap, or it's CRUD, right? Uh, yet another CRUD application. Yet another application that I have to write that just interfaces with a database to do these four basic operations. Allows a user to put in a record. Allows a user to list all the records. Allows a user to delete a record, et cetera, et cetera. It's a CRUD application. Right? Uh, but you're going to be playing with a uh, pre-existing application in your uh, last lab next week uh, that, the, that, that's with a, um, uh, a uh, video game database. Right? Uh, let's see. In fact, let's, let's go ahead and do that now. What we're going to do uh, so that we can do something different on Monday, uh, we'll just go ahead and finish this out here. If I've got a piece of paper. OK, good, I do have a piece of paper here. All right, let me go ahead and switch over to, this still works, OK. Um, desktop, all right, there. It's starting up. There we go. So. Let's design on a piece of paper here a video game database, right? just conceptually, OK? Because this is already done for you anyway in the lab. Um, bigger pen. Right? So what kind of, uh, when I think of a, data, uh, a database that represents a bunch of video games, I'm thinking I probably need a table for the game itself, right? So let's make a table for games. Tell me, what, uh, define a game for me. What, what, what would I need in here to represent a game? Very similar to a book. So, title, OK. What else? How am I going to uniquely identify a game? How did we uh, uniquely identify a book or an author? What were, th what were those called again? Primary keys, right? So I'll go ahead and put in a game. ID, right? Which is going to be an integer. Don't worry about the types here. Obviously, this is an integer. This is going to be a char star in C, right? That's how you're going to interact with them. Uh, what else is a game? Is it what? All right. So a genre, right? Let's keep it. Uh, or uh, what? What do you mean by type, actually? Like a PC game versus a console game? Oh, OK. So in other words, we've got some relationship between a game and the platforms that it's published on. OK. That tell, so should I put that in here? Or wait, what is a platform? A platform sounds like it's its own thing, right? Maybe we need another table here. And a platform is, say, a name, like PC or Mac or Xbox. Xbox One, Xbox 360. Are there any more Xboxes yet? What? You connect, OK. <laughs> All right, then PS1, PS2, PS3, PS4 eventually. All right. What else is there? Switch, Wii, Wii U, uh, NES, SNES, uh, GameCube. What was, am I missing anyone from Nintendo? The what? OK, so Atari, Atari 2600, uh, let's see, um, Neo Geo, if you want to go really classic, uh, Genesis, uh, trying to list them all off the top of my head here. Uh, uh, ooh, Sega, Sega Saturn, right? Anybody have a Sega Saturn? I'm sure that you can get one for five bucks at Gamers or something like that. All right, so th th that's a platform, right? And then all those would be names, except for, wait a second, how do I do uniquely identify a platform? Platform ID. OK. 
Maybe there's other stuff that we want to put in there. That's why I'm leaving room here. We can come back to that. Let's come back over here to game. What else do we want? What's the, what's the biggest game right now? They just released, uh, po what is it, Pokemon Sword and Stones? What is it? Sword and what? Sword and Shield. Okay, let's go with that. Uh, who created that game? Nintendo, right? They were the publisher. So maybe a game has a publisher, but wait a second. A publisher sounds like its own thing, right? So let's go ahead and make a publisher table. Now, again, same question as before. How do we uniquely identify a publisher? Publisher ID. And we, of course, want their name, Nintendo, whatever, 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 right? I've never played a Pokemon game. That just came to my head. Right. I do have a Switch, though. You, you can find me on Splatoon 2 if you want to. Right. That's, that's the only game you'll find me on, though. Right. All right. Oh, uh, uh, I'm X on all four. Right. Is, uh, nobody play, did anybody play Splatoon 2? No? OK. Darn it. All right, so. Publisher and game, what kind of relationship do we have here between these two tables? Let's think of that. Let's think of that before we move on. Okay, Nintendo has certainly published multiple games, right? Multiple Zelda games, multiple Mario games. So one publisher could have many games. The way that I'm going to represent that, at least pictorially, is through a connection between them, and then I'm going to put this chicken foot right here. Uh, we, we call it, it's a chicken foot, right? The chickens have three toes or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and so that, that's how it's actually represented in databases. You have a one to many relationship there. Right? Now, how do I capture that idea with respect to this? I want a foreign key. That's what we called it. Uh, so does, uh, should I have a game? Oh, let me go ahead and get a uh, pencil here so that I can uh, propose this. Should I have a reference to the game ID over here, or should I have a reference to the publisher ID over here? Publisher ID? All right. What's wrong with this? Publisher, Nintendo. They published uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield. All right. All right. What else did they publish, though? Zelda, Mario, whatever, 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 right? But I only have one game ID here. Right? That's not where the foreign key belongs. Now over here, I've got a game. I've got Splatoon 2. I've got Splatoon. Oh, I've got a uh, Pokemon Sword and Shield. I've got uh, whatever, 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 right? And I've got multiple publisher IDs. Those refer back to the for the primary key over here. So if I've got multiple records over here, each one of them will have the same publisher ID that re re references back to the same publisher. Now, if you turn this around and you look at this from top to bottom, you'll see that there's a publisher, say Nintendo, publishing Zelda, uh, Pokemon, and Mario, whatever. Right? You have a one-to-many relationship here. The reason that I put it on the side here is because you have a parent-child relationship. Right? Now, can a child exist without a parent? Mm, not unless they were, oh, it's called uh, you know, out of, you know, born out of thin air or something like that, right? So we have this, this relationship here. Uh, the child has an ID that references back to the parent. So that's the rule that you should follow. If you have a one-to-many relationship, this is a parent-to-child relationship, the foreign key belongs to the child so that they can reference back up to the parent. Now, a parent, can they exist without a child? Yeah, there are plenty of childless uh, folks out there, right? By choice or otherwise. Uh, so you can definitely have a childless parent. Can you have a parentless child? Well, what happens when, if you've got a parentless child? We call those orphans, right? And you don't want orphans in your database, at least. Right? We, we use the same nomenclature here, sorry. Uh, uh, but that, that's what we call them. They're orphaned records. You don't want that. 
So in other words, if you're creating a record, the parent has to exist before the child. What if you're deleting a record? What if I want to delete Nintendo out of my database? If I just deleted Nintendo, now what, all, what, what happens to all these records? They are now all orphans. So you don't delete it in that order. In other words, if you want to get rid of Nintendo, you have to delete all the children first, and then you can delete the parent record. Right? There. <laughs> We do call them parent, child, orphans, et cetera. All right, so that's, that's, a good, uh, that, that, that's good on this half of the database. Now let's go back to your idea of a game. Say, now, now we can't just have Nintendo titles anymore. Uh, so give me another title that's cross-platform. Say what? Call of Duty? Uh, Call of Duty is available on what? Xbox, PC. Switch, uh, switch. Oh, it is. It is. Okay. Well, I, I had no idea. Uh, I thought they were not violent, right? but whatever. Uh, so a bunch of platforms over here. All right. So a one-to-many relationship. Well, if I did that, then what about a platform? A platform only ever has one game. Would you buy a game system that only ever published one game on it? So we want a what kind of relationship between these two? We want a many to many, right? In other words, I want a chicken foot over here, and I want a chicken foot over here. But what do I put in between? I need a way of expressing that there is a one to many relationship and a many to one relationship. So I'm going to add yet another table that goes in between these two things. Right? And this is, I'll, I'll call this, and this is what we do in the lab, availability. So that a game, particular game, is available on a particular platform. And a particular platform has many games that are available on it. Right? So you can think of these relationships as verbs, basically. Right? That, a, uh, that a publisher publishes a game, uh, uh, a platform has many games, a game is available on many platforms. Okay? Transitive and intransitive verbs there, right? and the differences there. All right, so let's design this table now. What should I put first? ID, exactly, primary keys. And then what else, then now what do I need? Actually, sorry, I think we're going to have to redraw this because th if, if I just did this, right, that's a many-to-many -many relationship. But the way that I'm going to have to do this is uh, and I, I shouldn't have used the pen, is I'm going to have a many to many to one. I'll just incre uh, go back up there. There we go, right? That's, that's the actual, now this is still going to be a many to many relationship either way that you look at it. But the way that I'm going to achieve this is by putting this as the child record. So now I've got two parents. And when you have two parents, what do you need? You need two foreign keys so that you can refer back to your mother, refer back to your father. Right. So I will have a game ID here and a platform ID. Right. So these foreign keys go back to the game. This particular record corresponds to the Pokemon game, which is available on the Switch. This other record corresponds to the switch, which all, or also corresponds to the switch that also has Call of Duty available on it. Right? So by putting two foreign keys, and we usually call these FKs, FK, and we call these things primary keys, PKs, right? uh, then I'll, I'll just shorten them up there for you. Uh, then, we, then now we've got a pretty good start on our database here. We've got a one-to-many relationship. We've got a many-to-many -many relationship. This is generally called a join table. All right, that's two words. Why is it called a join table? It's joining this table and this table together right? uh, uh, w through these two foreign keys here. Now, one last question I'll ask you. Uh, is Pokemon released yet? OK, so when it, it was released last month? It was released in 2019, let's say. Where does that data belong? The Pokemon was, uh, no, sorry, let's, uh, let's, go with, uh, let's go with Call of Duty. Call of Duty was released on Switch when? Or it, has it been released? Well, let's say 2019, right? 
Uh, it was, let's say that it was re released for PC in 2018. Right? So in other words, a game and a platform could have different release years. You could release one game on one platform in 2018 and one game on a different platform in 2000, uh, the same game on a different platform in 2020. Right? So where does that, that data belong, the release year? Where does that belong? Does it belong over here in the game table? If I put it over here, that game was released on every system in the same year. That's not what we want to model. Does it belong over here in the, uh, in the platform table? That would mean that every game released for that platform was released in the same year. Right? So where does it actually belong? In the availability table. So release year. And we'll say that that's an integer. So you just need to understand, when you're designing a database like this, you need to understand, you know, where should I put my data? How should I relate my data? You could, of course, throw this all uh, out completely and just have one big giant table with all this da data as different rows. But now you're back at square one with a CSV file, a flat file, where you've got all the same problems as, as before. No integrity, uh, no relations defined, et cetera. The database. Can, uh, can model this and, uh, with four different tables. It can provide security. It can provide uh, multi-threadedness. It can provide data integrity. Right? Now, once again, I'll ask, a, can a game exist without a publisher? Can a child exist without a parent? No. So if I were going to insert a new a game record, what would I have to do first? I would have to insert a publisher record grab that ID and use that ID over here. What about, the, what about these three tables over here? What order do I need to do things in? Can a game exist without a platform? Well, remember it's a parent-child, so can a parent exist without a child? Yeah, so a game can exist, it just, it's just not available on any platforms yet. Can a platform exist without any games? Yeah, <laughs> it's a terrible platform, but sure, it can exist. Because it is a parent and this is a child. So now I can go ahead and independent, I could create the game first and then I could create the platform second, or I could do it just the opposite. Uh, but then once I've got these two records, now I can create an availability record that this game is available on this platform by putting in those two foreign keys right there. Right? So the platform has to exist, the game has to exist before I put it onto a platform. These two things have to exist before I associate them together, but they can exist in either order. And they don't necessarily have to be on any particular platform. And a platform doesn't necessarily have to have any games. If I were deleting them, say that I wanted to delete a game, what would I have to do? I would have to delete any availability record and then delete the game because I have to go bottom up. Would I ha if I wanted to delete Pokemon that's available on the Switch, would I have to delete the switch? No, why? Just delete the record associating it with the switch. Then you can delete Pokemon. The switch can still exist over here. Right? So the order is creation is top down, deletion is bottom up. Right? Remember that for your lab on Tuesday because we give you an API. We give you all the functions required to insert records, retrieve records. Uh, it's just that you have to put them uh, together in the correct order according to this, uh, this database design right here. All right. All right, I'll see you on Monday then.